So I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Ant Welsh and I work for Best Practice Network and my colleague um, Rebecca or Becky Muirhead um, is working in the background. Um, Becky will be collating the questions uh, that you put into the Q&A today. Just a little reminder as the very start here, the chat function um, is not being used today. So um, we will only be using that Q&A section. So if there's anything you want to put to the panelists and that could be comments, questions, reflections, of course, you know, interesting notes that you'd like to be considered, please use the Q&A function for that. And uh, my colleague Becky then will collate those as part of this session and will be passing those over to me. Um, and I'll put those to the panelists at the conclusion of all of their talks today. So just that reminder for those that have come in, we are recording, and so this whole session will be recorded so you to be aware of that. Um, use the Q&A section, please, which will be really appreciated. Um, and we've got five, we're delighted to welcome five speakers to today's session who will all speak around five to ten minutes um, with their thoughts around our title, um, Solving the Early Years Recruitment Crisis, Challenges and Solutions. And I'm sure everyone in the room has got an interest in this, therefore, um, you've attended um, a, a key point at the moment, very, very relevant, very, very current in terms of a webinar topic. So that's exciting um, in itself. So we're going to get underway and um, I'm delighted to introduce Michael Freeston, who is um, the Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance. Michael has worked for the Alliance for 20 years. He coordinates all aspects of the Alliance's quality improvement support to the earlier sector, including policy and procedures development, inclusion, workforce development and training. He also represents the Alliance on a range of policy fora with the Department of Education, the DfE, Ofsted and local authorities, the LAs. He represents early years on the DfE, DHSC, SEND and AP Implementation Board. We love an acronym in education. Well done, well said. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I've been practising. Um, is a member of Ofsted's Early um, Education Curriculum Forum panel and a member of various IFATE groups developing and reviewing apprenticeship standards. So with that introduction, Michael... Um, I'm uh, delighted again to, to welcome you and would love you to um, give your contribution to our attendees today. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, um, and thank you to everybody joining us today. I'm delighted to be invited to speak at this session for Apprenticeship Week. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Becky? Um, I have to say at the outset, with the title we've been given, I'm far more confident in outlining the challenges than I probably am in um, coming up with a solution. So I'm looking to other members. I can offer some suggestions, but I'm looking to other members of the panel to contribute to those particularly. What I thought I'd share with colleagues are a series of the challenges as the Early Years Alliance sees them. And this is drawn from our own research uh, and also other organizations with whom we're involved. And I think it just gives an overview of the circumstances that we face. Um, back in 2021, we did a survey in terms of the primary causes for sector staffing crisis, and I'm sure most people on the call won't be surprised to know that the two top rep uh, reported areas were low pay and feelings of being undervalued. At that time, 84% of settings were currently finding it difficult to recruit suitable staff. And we've also been involved more subsequently um, with the new Early Education and Childcare Coalition. Uh, we're a steering group member of that, and that has done recent, more recent research. With the, considering, um, the considerable concern that 57% of nursery and preschool staff and 38% of childminders are considering leaving the early years sector in the next year. And whilst that's obviously a, 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 a critical concern, I think what's also interesting is work that was done by Leeds University for the EECC is that actually the calculation is that we will need in the region of 50,000 new staff, that's giving consideration to the current rates of staff turnover, and also because of the expansion promoted by the increase in early entitlements, which we've got phased in from April of this year through until September. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and also we did a survey back on the expansion just after it was announced in the budget, I think it was of last year, carried out in July 23, where even at that point, providers were highlighting that not having sufficient staff was one of the key obstacles to delivering the expansion. So I think what it all shows is you always see headlines that say something is a crisis. And I think it will be interesting to discuss through today's session 
whether we have a crisis as in something about to fall off a cliff or whether we are looking at something which has been a structural concern over um, recent 10, 15 years. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. Uh, yep, taking it down through the bullet points. And I think there's also an, an additional consideration for our sector in particular, in as much that the very nature of our work gives us particular challenges in terms of recruitment and retention because of the demanding nature of the role in which we, uh, we operate. Um, back in, we did some research um, on mental health and wellbeing in the early years, sector. it's been done twice. Back, I think the first one was back in about 2018, 2019, but we updated it last year as well. 81% um, of respondents said they were regularly stressed about a work-related issue. Uh, and sector-specific government policy and pay listed as the most common causes of stress behind Ofsted inspections. And I was pleased to say that Ofsted had taken on board um, the research that we did prior to the terrible situation um, with Ruth Perry um, to see how they could give cons due consideration to reducing the well-being and anxiety concerns arising from Ofsted inspections in the early years. Um, nearly 60% of educators said they felt negative, negatively about working in the sector. And at this point, again, comparing with the previous figure I stated, at that time, 35% said they were considering leaving the sector as a result of stress and mental health difficulties. Please, Becky. Um, and I just thought I'd share with you the the what we what the alliance called for in result uh, in response to the, the findings from those range of surveys um just to give hopefully a bit of background to our subsequent um question and answer sessions what we need to have is a clear and comprehensive recruitment and retention strategy for the early years i think i'm sure other people and we'll mention today in terms of the recruitment drive that dfb launched last friday what i think we need however is something rather than just responses to particular circumstances, where do we want the sector to be in five, 10, 15 years time? And what staffing recruitment strategy do we need to ensure that that comes about? We also need consistent recognition of the earliest sector as an education profession, including high profile campaign to improve people, to encourage people into the sector. Clear and consistent career pathways. And I think that will be another topic for today's conversations. Um, and the inclusion of early years in all education announcements with an emphasis describing us as early education uh, rather than particular focus as it seems to be in this election cycle of childcare. Thank you, Becky. Um, just to highlight to those people who may not have picked up, um, the DfE's proposals, they launched last week under the campaign banner of Do Something Big, uh, Work With Small Children, um, the National Recruitment Campaign which will promote early years by highlighting the huge difference early years professionals can make, all the things we know about, but isn't often necessarily uh, know, known sufficiently well by parents and outside of our sector. It will be a multi-channel broadcasting campaign. And if you are an employer at the moment, there is a point there on the final uh, bullet point around um, listing your jobs on the DWPs, find a job vacancy because um, applicants can be directed straight to it from the campaign. So there is a, a shout out to employers to, to start listing their jobs on the DWD plat DWP platform as well, as well as anywhere else that they may advertise. So I think that's just one of the summaries in terms of what the DFE is doing. But I thought on, um, on my penultimate slide, Becky, please, I just... From the things that I've picked up when I speak with managers and I speak at conferences around the conference. Oh, back again, sorry. Um, just in terms of some of the factors that the sector has done for itself in terms of encouraging recruitment. And I won't say any more about these in particular because I think they'll come up in our Q&A. But clearly, particularly with the focus of this week, the potential that apprentices have to at least mitigate some of the staffing crisis that we face. There is the issue of golden handshakes, and I'm sure people will pick up the fact that in 20 pilot areas across the country, um, thousand pound payments are being offered um, to people who wish to join the sector. And I think it will be interesting to take reflections on from some of the people on the call today who may have offered those in the past and how beneficial they have been or not. Um, clearly, many providers are offering reduced prices for the children of staff who work in their sector. And again, whether those have shifted the dial, I'd be interested to know from people. 
Clearly, flexible hours is something which is attractive and one that we use in the Alliance, which I have to say I was sceptical about, but people really value is giving them their birthday off rather than it being part of um, their annual leave. It's been a really welcomed initiative. I'd be interested in other people's experiences of those, whether they think they've helped or not, um, and to take it forward. Uh, and finally, and I'm just going to leave this hanging, and if you don't mind, because one of the situations we always say that 37% or 47%, 43% of the sector is thinking of leaving. The thing I always want to turn around and ask the people is, why is it only that amount? If things are as bad as we continually say, what is it that makes you still be here? And if you know that, how do we bottle that and make sure that everybody else who may be joining this sector recognises that it is a fantastic um, sector in which to work and it is a hugely rewarding job? How it's incumbent on us to make sure those messages and what keeps you involved in the sector, that needs to be spread across those people who we want to join, because that is the only way that we will make a sustainable response to the recruitment and retention um, challenge. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, thank you indeed, Mike. What a lovely way to end, actually, yes, because we, we tend to focus on that sort of negative, the 50%. The headlines are over half of will always be the headline over half of are leaving but actually nearly half of us staying so yes there's a positive spinner an interesting one to end on then and perhaps will be picked up by um attendees in the q a just a reminder um if you wouldn't uh mind using that q a as you're starting to get your reflections i appreciate that's the first one uh, an amuse bush of the five speakers here today that will taste uh, as our opening um speaker thank you michael again um, as we move then to um, welcome Jill Mason um, as our spe uh, second speaker this afternoon. Uh, Jill is Head of Training and Development at Kids Planet Day Nurseries, um, is an advocate of the vocational sector, especially in early years as a career, with 30 years experience in the sector. Her roles have included primary school teacher, manager owner of a community-based early years vocational training centre, city PVI representative, an HE early years lecturer, Senior Qualifications Advisor and Examiner and an EQA for award, awarding organisations and college principal of a busy community college. In 2018, she joined Kids Planet as Head of Training and Development and launched the Training Academy, implementing a whole early years career pathway from entry to master's level, gaining an ESFA apprentice main provider status in 2020. Congrats. Um, Jill is also an experienced tutor assessor and IQA with MAMBA and published researcher currently undertaking a doctorate in vocational pedagogy. Oh, we'll have to have words about the doctoral studies, Angel. That's the <laughs> same as me. Good. And I'm trying to find a theme between them. So, so far, um, Michael has introduced Crisis, What Crisis, which is the, I'm sure you all know, the title of the album by Super Trump in 1975. So I'm trying to find a theme now as we go through, Jill. So, so over to you. Uh, we're all listening carefully. Okay, thanks, Anne. As long as it's a Bruce Springsteen theme, I'll be happy. Excellent. Um, yeah. Excellent. So, uh, thanks for inviting me along today to speak. And then uh, it's uh, lovely to build on what Michael's just um, spoken about, really. So, if you can move to the next slide, Becky. And just a little bit about Kids Planet Day Nursery, because I really want to speak about the approach that we've taken as well in Kids Planet to hopefully maybe come up with some solutions. Obviously, we haven't got many solutions, but we have had some impact with some of the things Michael's already mentioned, really. So it's it's like we rehearsed this or something. So, um, so we are a family-run group of 185 nurseries across the UK, and family is the important thing for us as well. We employ over 4,300 early years team members, and responsible for the care and education of over 20,000 children. And as Anne mentioned, we launched a training academy in 2018 and became a main provider of apprentices. And we wanted to do that because we wanted to look at the quality of delivery and made sure we were doing things in the way we wanted to, them to be done at Kids Planet. So there was a real sort of rationale behind why we became a main provider as well. Um, and we now obviously deliver outside the Kids Planet to other, other nursery settings as well. Next slide, Becky. Okay, and again, as we rehearsed, I wanted this quote from the um, the Co Coalition report that uh, Michael just mentioned, and I just think it really sums up the um, the integral and important role that early years educators play, um, and the multifaceted role really around the the you know driver socio economic equality. 
um, the um, the need to expand the workforce, but the need for the workforce to be highly trained, recognised and rewarded. And, you know, when we've delved into the reason why people leave, you know, it's unusually not about pay. It's about that recognition and that being in that, you know, that role up is really valued. So that comes across loud and clear in every evaluation sort of um, thing we carry out at Kids Planet and across the sector as well. So I just want to highlight that's not about making parents get back to work. It's, it's much more than that, really. Um, so uh, next slide. I sound like uh, thank you. So and also a quote from that um, report was a recruitment campaign is not a solution for a retention crisis. It absolutely isn't. What we find and what we find in Kids Planet and across the sector is far too many people leave within the first year. And Michael just alluded to that. So around 50, about 50% 50 of apprentices leave within the first seven months. That is far too many. Those that stay, stay. And that's a really good point that you make, Michael, because those that stay and complete, 97% complete if they stay. So when you flip those percentages around, that's a really important term. Statistic really that those who do stay and stay for quite a while. So why are people leaving in, in, in the first year? So that's what we've tried to look at in Kids Planet as well. There's obviously a cost of that continual recruitment for the sector. It costs a lot of time and money. So that's why we're trying to address that um, retention. And I also referred earlier to the low status of the sector and the brand. I still find outside people champion apprentices, but they're usually for the people's children sometimes. And actually, we, that brand alongside the early years sector and the low recognition is like a double whammy for the sector, really. So we need to look at raising the profile of the sector and the brand of apprenticeships. The parity of esteem and recognition falls in with that as well. If someone said to me in a DFE call the other week, if you could change anything, what would you change? And I said that early years educators were, were looked at with the same parity as teachers, the same recognition as teachers, because that's exactly what they are in the early years. Uh, and also, you know, a more recent thing through COVID has been the mis-selling of qualification qualification and qualifications that are valid. So we've got people wanting to join the sector, really qualified, and yet their qualification is not full and relevant. And they really don't want to go back and do a level two or three apprenticeship when they've got a degree or a master's in, in, in childcare. I know um, DFE have, have um, talked about how we're going to look at sort of transitional arrangements and, um, you know, looking at we fast track. That needs to come really quickly because more and more people are entering with those qualifications at the moment that could be really valuable, valuable members of the workforce. OK, next slide. And just stop all down, please. Yeah. So some solutions and suggestions that we've tried to put in place at Kids Planet. We've had a real focus on retention. So we've looked at our team benefits and we found that pay affects recruitment, but not so much retention. So it's those other things that make people stay. So the birthday day off, absolutely. That is something people really value. Um, extra holidays, well-being, celebrating achievements often, um, reduced costs for um, childcare for our team members, 80% of their childcare uh, fees are paid for. That's a, that has had a massive impact and it's a really good um, tool at recruitment that will sway people to join Kids Planet because it is a massive saving, but those people don't earn that much money as well. We just want to make it a really great place to work um, and that those are the reason why we've enhanced our benefits. A fast turnaround of applications. So when people apply and not waiting to hear back, you know, we're right in touch right away. Yes, please come along, come and visit us, come and see what we're about, come and have a day in the nursery, that type of thing. That's that's worked really well. Also, recruiting outside the box. I hear I was dismayed to hear this week that the percentage of men working in early years has fell down to 2.5% from 3%. I I just that's you know, it's it's such a shock, really. Um, so we do such a lot around recruiting more men into the sector. Sure, colleagues will speak about that. Um, so we've looked at our our different routes, our different um, you know, qualifications that we offer, our different apprenticeships that may in, in, in encourage more men to, to return. Uh, also looking at retainers and looking at our social media campaigns and doing things around TikTok and things which I don't really understand, but absolutely getting out there and it's sort of intentionally different audiences in as well has had a great impact. 
we have a real focus on well-being. We have our well-being manager who's just dedicated to the well-being of our teams. So well-being is not just a, a, a daily event or a monthly. It's every single thing we do is focused on well-being. We have a... Um, a lot of different apps and support and handbooks for apprentices. So it's really ingrained in what we do with Kids Planet and it has had a real impact. And people always talk about how, how useful the well-being approach is. We recently rebranded our values because we really wanted to look at what do we mean by values and values are not just for lamination and putting up on walls. They need to be ingrained in everything we do. So we rebranded values, care, which is community community, a safe place, reflection and excellence, all encoded in that word care, because that's what we do as well. We have an employee forum, uh, Every Idea Matters, where we've got reps from every single nursery across the country and they have a real loud voice in that. And we're also an age-friendly employer and, and, and we, our oldest apprentice is 57 and we're trying to you know, debunk the myth of apprentices of our young people as well. Okay, next slide. So, yes, yeah, so we set up the training academy to ensure that we have those career pathways in place from I'm thinking about working in early years to I want to be, you know, a senior manager, um, you know, a quality manager, an area manager. So all those career pathways are in place. So from a level two, level three, level five apprentice, we also have academic options working in partnership with uh, universities. We have a foundation degree a BA top up and a master's degree and we've just written a new level six pedagogical lead degree for those of our uh, teams that want to progress in, in that direction. We look at real sort of diverse roles so our recent initiative is to employ sports coaches uh, and they have a, an outdoor learning specialist apprenticeship around that that role so they become qualified and we embed the level three early as educated within that so that we've got a full and rele relevant qualification that has increased our males joining us um and i hate to play the stereotypes but it worked so a lot of sports coaches come on board on men and we've recently just touched with four percent of our of our of our workforce which is good to see on our male we also have a uh, oud school which is our approach to forest school uh, so it's a Danish classroom, it means, and um, so a lot more of those outdoor roles. I really encourage a different group of people joining the sector as well, which is great. And they are all taking level five apprenticeships. We tend to term our, our pathways unqualified pathways rather than apprenticeships as well. We found the language of that has really helped so that people will come on an unqualified pathway when really they, they are an apprentice. So that has worked as well, just as the semantics around that really and with an increased salary wherever possible for experience. Again, no age limit and lots of CPD. So we can meet all aspirations around send, panko, baby massage, baby yoga. That tends to keep keep people with us. They want to stay, they want to branch out in those, you know, sort of side step areas as well. So that's really helped with our retention as well. Okay, next slide. So this is just somebody needs some contact info from us. And um, yeah, if, if, by all means, get in touch. If you want any more information or do you want to come along a visit, then, then that would be great. But, uh, but thanks for listening. And that's just the final word of our care, care values. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm just uh, muting. Did you want to reference that last slide? Um... Of utilising the word care, did you? Yeah, so basically that was just our overarching word. I think of, of the where where the word care came from for our values. It's just that we just believe care to be a fundamental value that for these empathy, compassion, and concern, concern for the well-being of mm. others. So we really how we've um, come up with our values. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, really interesting insights there. The the just picking up on on a few points. I mean, I love to make that point. The integral role of of early years. You know. Um, so, so often it can be seen linked to your other point about that low status. For some reason, there can be this perception of, of a low status with early years, but such a crucial foundation, literally the foundation box you're building on. So a, a really interesting point there. A lot of traction that people commenting on that, that, that it's sort of echoing with them. Um, their sentiments which is lovely to see then um, a reminder of course to come into the Q&A again do make if you haven't got a question specifically it's okay to have a statement just a reflection that I could put to the the panelists um, as well and it would be interesting for people's reactions um, to elements within the um, 
the speaker's content. So, for example, then Jill offered a number of potential solutions. So what are people people's thoughts on that? You know, has that worked? Have people used that in their settings? Is there anything new there for you? So once again, thank you very much, Jill, uh, for your contribution. And we're going to move now um, to welcome Megan Pacey. And Megan is an associate of the LGIU and Sheringham Nursery School and Children's Centre. Uh, Megan is an early education policy into practice specialist and also an associate of Sheringham Nursery School and Children's Centre in East London. So it's a pleasure to have you with us here today, uh, Megan, and I'd like to invite you to, to contribute um, to our session. Welcome, Megan. You're still on mute for us at the moment, Megan, so I'll just point that out, <laughs> just in case. Apologies. It's a great start always, isn't it, when you're still on mute in 2024. <laughs> um, I don't have any slides, uh, but I do, I hope, have um, some solution or a solution that we're currently exploring on a very local basis. Uh, uh, I, um, as already been said, um, some of my time at the moment is spent in Newham. Uh, and this is an issue that Newham have been tackling and thinking about for a long time. Um, and I will focus mainly on that. But I think what I just want to uh, initially comment on is sort of how this national picture is playing out in Newham. Because uh, for those of you who don't know, Newham is in East London. It's a very poor London borough. Um, so lots of uh, social disadvantage uh, and uh, lots of socioeconomic challenges as well. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with the Newham scene, so to speak. So uh, recruitment crisis in early years is as widespread in Newham as it is anywhere else, and all types of provisions struggle to recruit and retain staff. Uh, in Newham, we have uh, a mix of both the PVI um, and very much a, a delivery of, of early education in schools, uh, be they maintained nursery schools or be they uh, classes in primary schools. Uh, so I just want to make that distinction as well. As we, we've not talked much about schools, but that that crisis is, is acute uh, in schools is in PBI settings. Um, I think the other thing I need to reflect on is that much of our early childhood education and care work is delivered through models that rely on a workforce that is low, lowly qualified uh, and paid not much more than the minimum wage and with almost half of that workforce claiming in work benefits. It's something I talk about a lot in the context of the local government information unit work that I do. Um, and that's really harsh in the new and workforce that we have to draw from. In Newham, as is the case in many London boroughs and many other parts of the country, nursery practitioners get more pay for fewer hours stacking shelves in the local supermarket. So that's our competitor in, in, in that sense. Uh, and many of um, our staff in, in the collective sense struggle with in-work poverty across the board. The workforce is one that is still largely dominated by poorly paid, often poorly trained and qualified and their women. Um, the budget that was not quite a year ago um, that was outlined and is all currently being implemented, we've seen some of that this week, um, makes absolutely no provision for investment in the workforce ahead of the commencement of this additional entitlement, which is, is you know, really in straight in us at the moment. Um, and what we all know is that all providers, be they schools or PVI settings, know from bitter experience that the expansion of entitlements without adequate investment in staff can lead to real challenges, and we're all living that at the moment. I mean, I would just say that things like relaxing the DfE ratios um, is, 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 is a solution, not necessarily the one we want, but, but, but a solution on the list. But uh, at the same time, when you're proposing additional welfare requirements on early years providers, so things like the supervision of children when they're eating, you know, sort of taking with one hand and, and giving with another. It, it's not, not something that's, that's really particularly well through in, in policy into practice terms. I think I also just want to reflect a little bit on the, the early years education recovery program that's there to supposedly support the sector. That was updated on the budget day last year, you know, almost a year ago, and that's now being rolled out. I really do think that we need a radical overhaul of those proposals. Um, and then the other thing I just sort of want to mention in the national context that we see a lot of in Newham is around parents, and particularly those of the youngest children, having the confidence that the staff in those settings will look after those children's safety and welfare and provide a quality educational experience. And to do that requires adequately trained, experienced staff. So I don't want to dwell too much on the challenges because I think those have been quite well articulated, but I will just mention a couple of things that have come up in the course of the couple of years that Newham have been exploring this. 
Uh, one, and the main issue I'm going to talk about is about the issue of a pipeline, a lack of a pipeline of staff, a lot of pipeline of people really, that, that could be potential staff uh, and, and a workforce. Um, but this has also been coupled with lots of concerns around the quality of the staff knowledge and the qualifications that they've had. Uh, we have at one point in Newham looked at um, what we've loosely referred to as a top up. So lots and lots of qualifications that actually arrive with you in a setting and just aren't fit for purpose. Uh, and the cry that you hear is, you know, I can't really leave them to do very much more than other than rinse paint pots. Um, and to look at the range of qualifications and what is lacking. Um, and that takes resource, uh, it certainly takes resource that, that Newham as a local authority doesn't have at the moment. Uh, and I would, would argue many local, the majority of local authorities don't have that, but I think that's, uh, and somebody's already mentioned about um, converting some of these qualifications so they are full and relevant and perhaps a top up uh, arrangement could be looked at as a potential solution uh, to that challenge. Also big challenges about the staff being job ready and that sort of transition from being babysitters that hovered uh, to educators that are engaged and on the floor and on their knees in settings. Um, and then the other thing that's been mentioned a lot is around the capacity to develop staff maturity to work in early childhood education and care and be relationship ready. So uh, that, that sense of it's one thing to turn up to work, but actually are you able to turn up to work and develop relationships with both those children and, and also their parents and, and work in that way. So the question that was put to me, which sort of was the one I thought, oh goodness, this is a real challenge, um, is around the solutions to make up the 50,000 practitioners that we need by 2025. We sort of just rattle that off, don't we? You know, they just sort of fall from the sky. I think you know, we're well aware that they're not going to fall from the sky and, and that there is no pipeline. So I want to talk a little bit around uh, the pipeline that, that Newham has, has explored and growing and kind of where we've got to with that. It's by no mean an accomplished um, model that can just be rolled out, but we've had some some really interesting learning along the way and some thoughts as to how uh, some of this might might be able to progress in the future. I think it was really, really important for us to acknowledge uh, what was the realms of the possible and what was in our in our control as, as providers in Newham and also with support from the local authority. You know, there is no golden pot of money that can just flood into things and sort these things out. So we're working in really constrained environments. Um, there was a real appetite to explore how early years apprenticeships might ameliorate the set significant recruitment and retention issues in early education and care settings across the board. So both in the PVI and in school settings. Um, and where we got to was the sense of needing to develop a, a pipeline, a local pipeline and grow our own. So uh, when we whittled that down, that sort of left us with two groups of demographics. One was around youth employment as big drivers and big leavers in Newham at the moment around youth employment uh, and particularly young school leavers and making sure that they continue to remain in, in education and training. Um, the experience in that context uh, from the provider's point of view was there were some really positive experiences, but there were also some not quite so positive experiences. It was a very personal thing. Um, you know, sometimes the, the relationship work, it clicked, it was great, but often it didn't. And it became more of a challenge and more effort to manage and then to manage out. Uh, and then you still didn't have the workforce that you needed. Uh, I mean, I think to, to also stress that schools and settings are really stressed and stretched places at the moment. And to be able to put that time and energy into that workforce development on a day to day basis is 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 challenging um, to use that word again. Um, but what we did do was look at how we could build links with career advisors in Newham, um, in both the secondary schools and in colleges and so forth. Uh, and we also spoke to the local Department for Work and Pensions Office, who obviously have had targets to move some of these um, individuals into, into other roles and how we could best support the demographic of that apprentice. And that sort of threw up a couple of things. Uh, one was particularly in Newham, but I suspect it's it's the same in other London boroughs and, and other parts of the country where we have the apprenticeship pay factor uh, that is treated as pay rather than as a training grant or, or levy and how that then played out in the household income. Um, and the, often that pay then put the household income into a tipping point where that affected the household benefits. And that was often meant that your housing um benefit or, or was reduced, those uh, individuals are often still living at home. And while mum and dad were great for going and, and getting out and getting and doing something, the minute it affected their benefits, they certainly weren't so keen on it. So there was a real push into uh, training uh, that was done with a grant as opposed to training that was done with an apprenticeship. 
uh, where where the money that was received was was treated differently by the DWP. So that's certainly something that we raised. I'm not sure it actually has been resolved, but uh, certainly something we've met, we've highlighted as a as a barrier at, at that level. Um, and then there was also some questions around how we could better support the issues of maturity and what it was to be dual job ready. We found with a lot of apprenticeships coming in that early stage straight from school, sense that the chains were off, you know, your life was no longer controlled by bells, you could go wherever you liked for lunch. Uh, and we had a number of apprentices that this never returned from lunch. So in a sense of you had a bit of money in your pocket, you could go and do what you like with it. Um, and if they'd returned, they were several hours late or, or whatever. So that kind of, you know, what it is to be a responsible employee and what that looks like, I think is probably, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to acknowledge that, that that was a challenge. And again, if you're running a setting that's pretty tightly run and pretty stretched at the best of times to suddenly discover you haven't got two apprentices back because they're still having lunch somewhere is, is not a great, great, um, uh, you know, element of your day, shall we say. Um, but the other, the rest of my time I want to talk about is around this, what would I call the return to work employment demographic. Um, we had at the sort of about the same time an opportunity to present to work, presented to us to work with an organisation called Grow, and I'll put that in the chat comment uh, shortly so you can have a, bit, a little bit more of a look at those, um, the work that they do. But they're basically an organisation that supported work, uh, women in particular, that were who the furthest from the labour market on their journeys towards work. Uh, they had previously worked with two of the maintained nursery schools and children's centres in Newham, um, and they have a programme that they've developed that supported women returning to work who wish to work in school and settings with children to gain appropriate skills and qualifications. So the GROW programme starts as an introduction to work programme, it's a confidence and motivation programme and all that goes with that. So some of that's around exploring what you want to do, what those options might look like, what your barriers are, sorting your CV out, all that kind of thing. Um, at the moment, we're in a situation in Newham where the bulk of the work that's going on with uh, Grow and Newham, uh, their candidates are entirely recruited from our own schools, children's centres and settings. Sheringham, where I'm based a couple of days a week, uh, currently holds a waiting list of parents who want a place on these Grow programmes. So there is definitely a pipeline there. You know, they come to Sheringham, they enrol their kid, they do their 15 hours. Uh, mornings or afternoons and you know part of that package for that almost induction practice on yes they put their hand up they'd like a place on grow um and what that looks like um is the grow program explores the type of work that might might be available to them and what we do find is the majority of those those women want to work in local schools and settings um they are often sort of uh, leaving the phase in their life where they've had their own children and they're moving to school um, so part of that kind of key factor in their their thinking was that school hours was a major a major chunk of of that needed to work. Uh, but what we did acknowledge was that those people were already in our pipeline. They were already in our in our midst, um, and that was really important. The end of that introductory pro introductory program, there is an individual plan created for each person, uh, depending on the individual. Sometimes it's about uh, improving their English, so additional la English um, courses. They might go into a food hygiene certificate. They might do a more specific uh, qualification uh, that relates to children in some shape or form. Uh, and what we have used uh, in the last year is some of the basic online child development course training that's part of the Stronger Practice Hub offer. Uh, they can access that as kind of a taster to sort of see what that's like, whether that is really the road they want to go down. Uh, Sorry, quite Megan, a lot of the work... give... Sorry, Megan, just sort of maybe some closing comments, actually, because we, we just need to keep yeah, the time. I'm almost there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So about well. resolving housing benefit, immigration, those sorts of things, give them a sense to, to volunteer in those, those settings, uh, as well as an enrolment in a formal course or qualification. And I just really quickly want to sort of touch on the things that we've learned. And, and the, the, the point I really want to make is around that this is a process and it's a process that's likely to take six months to a year because of the demographic of the pipeline. There are lots and lots of ducks that kind of need to be lined up. But what we also know is the demand from government and the sector is that we need it now. We can't wait that six months. But I would add, it can't. I, you know, we we can't wait. It's a very short termist approach to say we can't wait. Um, and if this approach had been resourced a year ago, we'd be able to support some of these. Uh, you know, some of these people would be in the workforce. That that pipeline would be flowing. Uh, and if people went in and, and and after Easter this term, you know, that we'd have them in the, in the workforce by next January. So you, um, if I can just, I, I yeah. will have to stop you there for a second, just to make sure we, we hear from Claudia and uh, uh, Jordan within the hour, I'm afraid. 
Um, if, but thank you so much for your contribution at that point. But we are just going to have to move on now. Um, there might be some time at the end, uh, depending. We've we've got about um, 18 minutes left now um, for, for our final two speakers. So um, thank you very much. I'm sorry, my, my apologies for having to kind of stop that. But I appreciate um, the attendees' time. They, they might have to move on at, at three o'clock. Um, some really interesting, well, many interesting points there, Megan, and I'd love to, to, to have time to carry on there. Um, as with all the speakers, but interesting there about um, the hovering babysitters, I thought was an interesting phrase, um, and moving into educators. I think that's a potential link to the low status there, that sometimes when you speak um, to parents, carers, etc., that sometimes there is this sort of perception of this moving from babysitters and understanding that actually these are highly skilled, highly trained, knowledgeable professionals who are educators um, in the early years. I think that's a really interesting point. Loads of comments coming up in the background. We're having things. People are loving the webinar, um, our comments that have come out. So thank you very much for everyone's strong contributions. Uh, and we move on now to um, Claudia Natulo. Um, Claudia um, is a senior talent partner at N Family Club um, and as a qualified people generalist um, at that organisation with a background in talent, Claudia brings a, key, a keen eye and passion for all aspects of people and talent. She has worked at N Family Club for the last four years specialising in areas such as recruitment, employer branding, compensation and benefits and employee engagement. So Claudia, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and ask you to uh, share your contribution, please. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I don't have a presentation either and I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm going to try and be as succinct as possible. Just a bit of an introduction, as um, you mentioned, I work at N Family Club, we're a group of 31 nurses born in 2017 with a clear and strong vision of um, inspiring and developing the next generation in this ever-changing world. Uh, and since we started um, N Family Club, it's had a real focus on rethinking early years education and the way um, educators are valued. Um, so we've kind of always been working on solving the challenges that have are part of the sector. Um, I'm not going to retouch on the challenges because again, everyone has clearly laid them out. Uh, so things like competitive recruitment market, unvalued educators, invalid qualifications, motivational recognition. These are all things that obviously the sector is experiencing. Um, I think I would like more to focus on the solutions and maybe um, there's some that have already been mentioned, some that maybe haven't been spoke about. So given we've only got a few minutes left, I might just talk about what's not been spoken about. Um, I think given my big passion, one of the big things that obviously um, will aid the sector is really focus on retention and not just recruitment, a bit like Gil mentioned. Um, and I think when it comes to retention, there's a clear lack in um employers really focusing on building a strong brand, uh, a strong employer brand and being an employer choice. And obviously employer brand means many different things, but a strong employer brand for me is one that focuses on um, the main unique things that employees and team members care for. Um, so we really focused on being benefits. We really focused on career development and training opportunities. We really focused on giving everyone a voice. So initiatives like ambassadors and initiatives like um, internal communication channels, these are all super important. Um, we really also focused on um, building an inclusive and flexible workforce. So obviously we know that educators and everyone working in LES has to be on site, but how can we still as a sector provide flexibility to those team members, whether it is job shares, whether it is um, bank team members, whether it is compressed working weeks. Obviously, it has been said that this can be also quite stressful jobs, but people still clearly feel passion for it. It gives them a real purpose and it gives them strong relationships, both with team members, children and parents. So there's clear, clearly a real passion for it. So how can we encourage that whilst encouraging team members to have their well-being and have their work-life balance? I think that is something that is key. Um, so that has been massive for us. And I think in terms of expanding talent pools, um, things that we've touched on are really important. So targeting more men in the early years, age-friendly employers, we've actually partnered with an organization called Restless and provided apprenticeship to 50 plus um, years old. Um, so that is, again, expanding the talent pool there. And also looking at international sponsorship. I know obviously immigration laws are changing now, but for the last... 
um, ER. So we have also focused on that and had great enriching additions to our team who love them. So um, that is also something that we have focused on. Um, something else that's not been mentioned that I think is also quite important, and maybe you know, Gil's mentioned it as well, is about the variety of roles. Um, so I think there shouldn't just be conventional roles and conventional progression routes, but also unconventional ones. So where it comes to an educator, what if I don't want to progress to a room manager role? What if I just want to be the best possible educator that I want to be? Or is there anything that I can do to kind of express my freedom within the framework at work? So roles like for a school lead or we do yoga with children in nurseries, um, Spanish teachers. So there are all sorts of different roles that can accommodate different um, purposes and needs of team members. Um, and I think with that internal mobility as well, it's quite important in that if I don't want to just progress for that conventional route, where can I go from here? Could I move into an office role? Could I move into a different role? So how can we do our best to value our team and love our team? Um, and finally, I'm just going to take a couple more minutes um, just to talk about, I know that we've mentioned a few solutions, but I think really turning to our own team members to ask what their thoughts are will be the real solution. So just exit interviews, just moments to talk with them, the employee ambassadors, they are the ones that do the work day in and day out. And they are the ones that can probably tell us how to best move forward. And we are very, very driven um, in our decisions by our own team members. Um, and it has been the best decision ever from the start. Um, so yeah, I'll probably stop mm. here just because I'm close to time and I hope I've not gone too fast. <laughs> It's okay. No, no, I, I could answer those perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia, and appreciate yeah, your tailoring. Uh, um, it, it is obviously as we get towards the end of the of the talks. Uh, apologies, Jordan, as I introduce you. Um, I really appreciate uh, you tailoring then um, your talks as you go forward because they're potentially then people have said things in terms of challenges and both solutions. So thank you for kind of thinking um, on the spot. That really interesting point around brand um, and being the employer of choice. I think that's a really um, an interesting point. People commenting on that in the background here. Um, and the variety of roles, yes, really exploring that and thinking outside of the box in terms of unconventional, non-conventional types of things you can do within the sector. Really interesting. Thank you, Claudia. That was um, lovely. And then we move to our final um, speaker today, um, Jordan Tully. Um, Jordan is an experienced early years professional specialising in operations, leadership and management. He has supported settings grow both their profitability and their portfolios. Jordan has recently started his own podcast series. Um, so getting that in here, exploring early years with Jordan Tully. And then through conversations, questioning and reflecting, he intends to deep dive into early years topics as part of that podcast. So um, welcome, Jordan. And I invite you to, for your contribution um, to our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. I will apologise to everyone in the beginning. I woke up this morning with a very sore throat. So if I do cough, then please just... Uh, just accept my apologies in advance. So um, if we move to, to the first slide, yeah, perfect. So something that I wanted to focus on was, because I, I thought everybody else would focus on challenges as well. And I think it's really important that we, we focus on, on all of it. And actually, as I've listened to everyone else on the panel discuss, it's, it's quite scary because although none of us have shared what we were going to say in advance, it all sort of has aligned. Um, so we're obviously all singing off the same hymn book, which is nice. But um, for me, something that I really wanted to focus on now, I don't work in recruitment. I work in supporting groups. My last role was, as I say, supporting a group grow from eight to 32. Um, and with that, we obviously grew our staffing problems because as the as the portfolio grew the number of nurseries that we needed to staff also grew and something that that we did was which is what most people have said on this panel as well is strip back and look at why people are here in the first place not even necessarily just with your group but why are people in the sector <clears throat> what is it that people are staying for and once you've been able to work that out it gives you a bit more of a of a foundation to start. And I've got these three people on my screen now. Now, they have given me full permission to use their photos, just because I've worked with these people in the past. Um, but the information I'm going to give you about them is made up. So we could look at three different people, and this is how we started our process before. And we looked at three different people. 
you've got myself or those a few years ago um, and we looked at what was important to each of them so for me um, what was important was career progression you know the team I worked with appreciation the, the lady in the middle Sarah we, we looked at what was important for her and it was uh, the setting and the environment the team but a supportive manager that would help with mental health and then we looked at Roop and what was important to Roop was training, gaining a qualification, career progression, work-life balance. Now we looked at all of these things and I don't think any of us said the same thing necessarily, but we then stripped it back and said, what do we all have in common? And the thing that we all had in common was we're in the childcare sector, our passion for the children. So for me, our Oh, it was never going to reinvent the wheel. It's it's never going to be about, we're never going to draw tens of thousands of people in with this approach. But I think we need to strip it back and look at why people are here and what can we take from our team that we've already got and the things that we already know and build on that. Because I think sometimes we're all looking for this, this big answer, this big solution. And I think it, it might come one day, it might come with the, you know, this monetary incentive, it might come with things like that, but it might not. I've also, you know, just to share experiences, I've I've supported groups where they have tried this and that's worked. And then maybe when the terms of that, that benefit are over, they move somewhere else that offers that benefit. And that, you know, that that's fine too, if that's what that person needs to do. But we, we, we we've got three things when I think about this this question that we were all asked about the the recruitment crisis and i think for me there's 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 multiple crises it's a recruitment crisis a retention crisis but also a staffing crisis because we also want to make sure that the staff we're getting into these settings are high quality and like you say they're not just fighting babysitters they are educators they are there to provide that care aspect but also there to extend on the children's learning and i think what's really important is look at your job adverts look at what you're putting out there because what might attract me wouldn't attract Sarah. What would attract Sarah might definitely not attract Root. What might attract Root might actually attract me a little bit, but not as much to make me apply. And we we did this and we then started creating, which sounds a lot, and we were lucky to have a, a marketing team at the time, but we started creating multiple ads per job role and ads that focused on you know, some some ads were really wordy and lengthy that talked about the career progression, the, you know, all of the benefits, all of those things. But then we also created ads that had pictures of the environment, you know, team nights out, because different things attract different people. But no matter what calls you to come, we're all here because we have the same thing in common, and that is for the children. So I think we need to strip it back a little bit and actually look at what are we, before we can moan about what we're bringing in, Let's reevaluate, re reflect, review and improve what we're putting out. And let's have a look at the quality of our of our ads, the quality of our brand and what we're putting out there and then reflect on it. Because one job advert won't work for everyone. You know, uh, we had a farm, one nursery on a farm. Now, wouldn't have attracted me at all. The idea of walking past the cows, it, it did nothing for me. But someone else, oh my goodness, they absolutely loved it. However, if they'd have shown me what what beautiful enabling environments they had inside rather than focusing on the outside, I would have applied there. So it's about making sure that we are tailoring our ads to be so broad that they cover so many people or making multiple ads because although that's not going to, like I say, bring tens of thousands of new people in, it might attract one or two different, different people. And I'm not going to go on too much longer, but I, I had a set in and we were really fortunate enough to break down the barrier of the, the male childcare percentage. And I had 45% of my staff male, including my chef. And it it was, it was unheard of. And the way that we did it was focusing on the different things, because again, we, we talk about males and obviously Jill mentioned and it, and she did obviously say it was a stereotype and it does work about sports coaches. That just does bring the males in too. Clue wouldn't attract me. I wouldn't apply for that role. I wouldn't know where to kick the football. So th that wouldn't go for me. However, something else might. And when I looked at these males that I had, I asked them why. And by using that, I was able to then use that information to progress my search to help with bringing other other males so one of them you know he was really good at technology one of them was a, a, ter a stereotypical man who liked rolling around in the mud and um you know another one did something else you know and between that but this one one advert by saying we want a male in the setting it wouldn't have attracted all four or five of those different males so i think it's just about 
making sure we diversify our search and make sure that our ads are actually attracting maybe the people we haven't even thought of yet because I may not apply for that ad, but I'd hope you'd want me. So just something to think about. Last slide. And it's just to say, as I said, so diversify your job adverts and consider new ways of doing things. Just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean it's the only way. And there's a very dangerous saying, and it's, it, it's you know, well, we've always done it that way. Well, that's fine. But if you've always done it that way, you're always going to get the results you've got. And if we are sat here acknowledging the crisis we're in, the crisis, that's what we're going to call it, you need to be prepared to try new things. So that would be my advice. Thank you for listening. Mm. Yeah, lovely. And again, thank you very much, Jordan, uh, for taking that last, that final shift there uh, and uh, tailoring that. But, but really interesting, um, you know, well worth the wait, that, uh, Jordan. So thank you so much for that really interesting perspective there about multiple job adverts. I'm just thinking, I, I from my own background, we put lots of effort into our job advertise our advertisements, but that's the first time I thought about putting different adverts out for the same role. So that's a really, that's just fascinated me there. And that point about what are we putting out? We're saying about what we're getting in, but actually, what are we taking in terms of a proactive approach in going in what's being projected out from our organisation? Echoes earlier there of, um, you know, being the employer of choice, that, that kind of point uh, from Claudia earlier. That's really interesting there. So, again, thank you so much, everybody, um, for uh, joining us today. Um, we are actually now just coming up to one minute to three. So I'm conscious that we need to kind of draw the webinar itself to a conclusion on, on the hour for those that wish to leave the session. Um, such interesting themes for the speakers. Um, we've had uh, they've uh, the um, attendees have said they've loved that there's been a focus so strongly on solutions. It's so lovely to see that as a as a fresh perspective as opposed to everything being based on here is a list of a thousand challenges. There's been a strong emphasis on solutions. There, people really enjoying the the experience. Comments about flexible hours and meeting the needs of of everyone, the children, etc., babies. Um, speed of qualification has been a question for consideration. Um, 14 months when organisation has said is the quickest they can get people qualified in the experience of doing that quicker. Um, and agree that point with Megan said earlier about, you know, staff need to be adequately trained. So we don't want to necessarily make it so quick that then we have inadequate staff coming through. Um, and then the child benefit links, apprenticeships, etc. has been mentioned recently by the minister. That's a, an interesting point just to throw in there. Um, and then the stronger practice hubs, just another thing then to kind of consider um, as a concept as part of our webinar, just so that it's in the recording to make sure that that's part of the session today. Um, so um, it's it's for me to say thank you to Michael, Jordan, Megan, Jill and Claudia for their participation today. Um, I'm just going to make sure that we conclude on time in terms of three o'clock for the webinar itself to conclude. I'm not sure if anyone on the panel is able to stay just for a few minutes if anybody wanted to have a conversation outside of the um, the time we have. Um, and I'll just look to people to either stay in the room or go. But again, thank you so much for your contributions from our panellists. Thank you so much for you all for attending today's session. And a thanks to Rebecca, Becky Muirhead in the background, who has been managing all of the, the Q&As and has done such a wonderful job setting up the webinar for us as well today. So thanks, everyone, as a, as a formal end to our hour.